Let's bring in some of my NBC News colleagues. Dasha Burns is on the ground in Pennsylvania ahead of former President Trump's rally later tonight. Steve Kornacki is at the big board for more on the battleground implications of the vice president's upcoming campaign swing. And our chief political analyst, Chuck Todd, is here with me on set. Now, Chuck, I want to start with you. Your initial reaction to this NABJ conference, do you think Donald Trump was trying to go in there to get a rise out of this group and perhaps appeal to his base? Well, that's what, certainly his always, it's his default. Right. This is his default mode. You know, you have default settings on any sort of piece of electronic. Yeah. This is his default setting. And I do think that his instinct was, hey, I'm going to get into I want to get into it here. I'm going to see if I can create some tension in the room. And I think he thought I don't know where he got this idea. And I think he thought somehow that he could play her mixed identity mm -hmm. somehow that that he could he could do this. A and, you know, I've, I heard from a whole bunch of people as this was going on, particularly Republicans who say, why is Donald Trump trying to help Democrats with get out the vote for with the well, uh, exactly African right. Americans? Look, the Biden campaign it's just st astonishing. They had to be loving this in a way. I mean, they were already tweeting out their war room. You did the Freudian slip there. The Biden campaign. You meant the Harris oh, that's campaign. Right. I know. Oh my goodness. Welcome. You know, I'm having to catch myself all week <laughs> doing that. Um, yes, the Harris campaign. Right. They were posting on social media videos almost immediately. Well, you know, my initial now reaction to this is I I I think Chris Acevedo and Susie Wiles, the two people that are running this campaign, that have brought as much discipline as is possible around Donald Trump. There's only so much you can do as long as you can sort of keep him away from unscripted moments. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the likelihood of a one-on-one -on -one debate between Trump and Harris just dramatically, if you could watch it as a stock market, you would sell right now because the likelihood of, of, of them, it's, there is no good that will come out of a one-on-one -on -one debate with Donald Trump. He has never handled being questioned by African women, uh, African American women well. It has always gone off the rails like it did today. And Chuck, just really quickly, can you guesstimate how many times in the past eight, nine years since Donald mm -hmm. Trump came into the political arena that we keep saying, "Oh, he, this is too far. He's gone too far." The racial identity question today would have torpedoed any other politician. This doesn't even seem like one of those moments because it, <laughs> we're so well, used to it, it by I, now. Yes, I take your point on that. But I think what you what you really have here is it just, you know, this it, it is a reminder. He's always been his own worst enemy. He's always been, you know, he he talks himself into problems mm -hmm. where if he literally said less, if he just no showed today, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. If he just. It, you know, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't know how to admit a mistake. He doesn't, it just, he, if he did, he'd have had a second term. If he did, you know, mm -hmm. the, you know, the problem is we could sit here and say, but if only he would do this, it doesn't matter. That's not who he is. This is who he is. As I was saying right. out there to some cop, Trump's going to Trump. Mm -hmm. And that's what we saw today. This was in some ways vintage Trump. He can't help himself. And in this case, this is why... I've, I've ha I have some skepticism whether the country's ready to elect Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. but the idea that this would make him disassemble was always what I thought was a potential here, that, that he could essentially lose the race against her. And it's moments well, like this where he's losing. Well, I want to bring in Dasha Burns, who is live for us in uh, Pennsylvania right now, where in just a couple of hours there's going to be um, a, a rally uh, for uh, Donald Trump. You can already see the crowd uh, behind you, Dasha. How is the campaign feeling about these comments that he made about Harris's heritage this afternoon? Look, Abe, they're already on defense. The Trump War Room Twitter account is retweeting uh, supportive tweets from uh, from their allies and also tweeting saying uh, this goes to show that fake news journalists don't care about inflation. They don't care about border security. They don't care about improving our schools, uh, et cetera. They just care about, quote, getting Trump. So uh, they're on defense. We're out to comment uh, for comment from the uh, campaign officially. We're waiting to see what the former president says on Truth Social but uh, they are leaning into this was a combative environment that he went into and uh, this this is how the former president chose to handle it. So the former president's uh, campaign, how do they feel about Kamala Harris getting all this media attention over the last couple of days? The, uh, you know, the media ecosystem has just been dominated by headlines about her. Is this a position the Trump campaign is used to? 
Okay, you and I both know very well the former president does not like it when he's not the center of attention. And who knows, perhaps what uh, he just did at the conference there was a, a way to get the headlines focused on him again, uh, for better or for worse, right? But this has been the, the real recalibration, the change in the dynamic that they've had to deal with. A new opponent who has a different background, who has a different relationship with the Democratic base and potentially uh, with some of those voters that are still undecided and they're having to pivot and shift strategy in real time here and I think we're watching that uh, play out right now Gabe. Dasha Burns live for us in Pennsylvania. Dasha thank you and I want to bring in Steve Kornacki now. Uh, Steve Vice President Harris and her running mate are uh, running mate to be I should say are making seven stops next week in each of the top battleground states. So what does that tell you about the path the uh, Harris campaign sees to get to the White House? Yeah, so a couple ways to look at this. If we say seven, we've been saying there's six core battleground. They say North Carolina is, is right in there. North Carolina is a little different from these other battleground states in this way. All of the other battleground states went Biden in 2020. North Carolina was still a Trump state in 2020. But basically, look at it this way. Where things had been before Harris got in the race, before she switched in for Joe Biden, the Biden campaign was looking at an extremely narrow path. I'm just going to show you, uh, again, you see Harris's name, but when Biden was the uh, likely Democratic nominee, the Biden folks were basically saying this was going to be their wall, <laughs> their fortress. Those three big 10 states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, it would just get them to 270 because the problem was Biden was struggling in particular with non-white voters, with Hispanic voters. Uh, he'd been lagging by a pretty big margin, what, what Democrats typically get with black voters. And so these more diverse sort of sunbelt states here, the polling was the worst for Biden there relative to these states. Now, with Harris as the likely nominee here for the Democrats, the question is, does that start to change? Can she do something in these Sunbelt states that would allow her not to have to win all three of the states up here? So, I mean, take a look right now. If Trump, you know, if Trump were to sweep all of these, right, again, he'd be at 268. He would just need one of these states up here in the in Big Ten country. But what if, you know, what if Harris was able to pick off? I mean, here's an example. The polling is suggesting right now Harris is doing uh, better with Hispanic voters. There's a growing Hispanic population in Georgia. Margin there was 12,000 for Biden last time around. What if Harris was able to get Georgia? Well, now she's at 286 in this scenario. And now let's, you know, if she were to lose Michigan, mm. she could afford it. So she can open wow. up more, pa every and one of these Sunbelt states, if she's able to win any of them, when she does, if she does, it takes the pressure off these states here in the Midwest. And Democrats see with Harris the growth potential for their coalition this, in this election relative to Biden. The growth they see a lot of it is with non-white voters, both with support levels and enthusiasm levels. If that's something that plays out, and that is a big if right now, we're talking if right now, but if that's something that plays out, it will you'll see it much more clearly in a Georgia, in a Carolina, in an Arizona, in a Nevada than you will in a state like you know, Wisconsin. It's about 90 percent white. You know, the states up here are older, whiter populations. So can she move that battleground around? Can she open up the South and not have to rely on Big Ten country? You know, Steve, a lot of the conversation right now over the VP pick is how that might change the electoral map. Kind of walk us through that if you can. You know, Arizona versus Pennsylvania Governor uh, Shapiro versus uh, Senator Mark Kelly or even Governor Walls might help in the Midwest. What are the calculations that the Harris campaign is making right now with regards to those vice presidential picks? Yeah, you know, it, it's really interesting because, you know, uh, and it's resetting this right here. Um, it, it's interesting because you really, we hear it all the time. Hey, put this candidate on the ticket, get this state. It doesn't really happen that much that, that presidential nominees actually go for that strategy. But again, resetting the battleground here, let's say Harris were to pick a, a Josh Shapiro, the governor of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, 19 electoral votes. It is by electoral votes the largest of any of these battleground states. And right away, that would put Harris at 245. And again, it just opens up all sorts of possibilities for her. We showed you if she could win, if she got Pennsylvania, and she could just get Michigan and Wisconsin, there's 270. But if you got Pennsylvania in your pocket and you could say pick off Georgia, look, now she's within 10. Now Arizona 
would get her there. You see, that's the, the Pennsylvania, you know, because it's so big in terms of electoral votes, you get Pennsylvania, you can lose both of these other uh, Big Ten states if you're getting Georgia, Arizona. It, it doesn't work the other way. If you don't get Pennsylvania, let's say Trump were to get Pennsylvania, I'll reset this. If Trump were to get Pennsylvania and Harris got, let's say, Wisconsin instead, see, she's short. You know, or if she were to get, reset this one, if she were to get Michigan, she's short. So Pennsylvania of these Big Ten states is particularly important. The multi-talented Steve Kornacki. Steve, I understand you're off to Olympics coverage now. So thank you for joining us. We really do appreciate it. And it. now that we have uh, Chuck yeah. still with us, look, Chuck, what we just talked about with Steve, mm -hmm. how surprised are you that the electoral map just kind of just blew up right now for the Harris campaign just before President Biden dropped out? I remember the campaign was talking about, oh, we right. could do well in North Carolina. And, you know, people are just kind of rolling their eyes now there's all this optimism. Well, sure, but we're at generic Democratic numbers now. What, what, what Harris has done, and, and I, I get that there's a whole bunch of enthusiasm in it, and sort of right now, you know, when, when you're starving, every cracker tastes like a Ritz. Mm -hmm. And I think right now, Democrats are in that mode with Kamala Harris. It's like, oh my God, finally, we have somebody who can put two sentences together, who can say the word abortion. And it, and it feels strong. What she has done is proven, she has raised the floor to generic Democratic levels. And when you do that, then it puts all seven of those states in play. I do think when it comes to the running mate thing, you shouldn't think about it by state. You need to think about it by constituency group. And the question is whether, look, one of the, one of the reasons why Trump was overperforming in the South and why Biden still had a shot in the North is that inflation has been, it, the, the Sun Belt has been hit harder by inflation. Why? Because people were moving there. People were, you know, real estate has gone up higher in the Sun Belt cities than they have in the northern uh, cities. So that is why Biden hadn't been sort of wiped out yet up north, but he was sort of playing from behind. I still think that's going to be a challenge for her. Um, her place on the ticket mm -hmm. motivates African American voters, which in theory puts Georgia and North Carolina within striking distance. But to me, the only way you put it, you can actually win those states, if she, there are two. Two people on our short list that have a military background, Tim Walls and Mark Kelly. Georgia, North Carolina in particular, mm -hmm. has a lot of military veterans in it. Um, Arizona does as well, so does Georgia. And the border and military, uh, and, and, and military background, I think, naturally sort of fit together. That is why I think, well, if you play the one-state strategy with Pennsylvania, I don't know where Josh Shapiro helps you anywhere else or with any other constituency group, where Kelly and Walls, because of their military background, suddenly, I think, because if you start to look at the numbers in North Carolina, you can't win without some portion of the white vote. That's a military veteran vote. And that's why I think both Kelly and, and Walls are also on the short list. Chuck Todd, so you think this is a uh, sugar, we're, you're, in the sugar that, you're in the sugar high camp. But th that doesn't mean it's going to fall. Right. What I'm okay. saying is, is it's raised the floor, but this is, she got the generic Democratic vote back. Mm -hmm. And now Donald Trump's doing her a solid here by helping her even more with the non-white vote. Chuck Todd, our chief political analyst. So good to have you. Thank you, Thanks, sir. Chuck. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.